Welcome, Mr. Stephen Bonji. A pleasure to have you here. Uh, the reason why we're really excited by having Mr. Stephen Bonji here in Stockholm is because he is a leading expert on the topic of strategy and art of action. Why this is interesting is because even though we would have fast-moving agile teams, they still need to have some type of direction, and the direction needs to make sense. And we thought of no better way of learning about this from one of the leading experts in the world. Now, you developed a concept, and you also wrote a book called Art of Action. And you also have coached uh, anything from business units, military, to F Formula One teams on yes. this topic. Can you briefly describe what is Art of Action? Okay, the Art of Action uh, developed as a way of executing strategy effectively in a fast-moving, uncertain environment. Uh, it was developed uh, by the military. It pops up over time. The example that I've chosen is a more recent one uh, because it was developed by the Prussians under Helmut von Moltke. And they'd already created a, a culture, I suppose, that was pretty agile, where they encouraged low-level decision-making. They pushed decisions down and got people to d make decisions that they defined as about right now. But they discovered that they lacked alignment. These guys were going off and making poor decisions. And what Moltke did, as a result of his experience in campaigns he conducted in the middle of the 19th century, was to introduce a technique for aligning people around what to achieve and why, whilst giving them freedom of action around how. So you got high alignment and high autonomy at the same time. Why it matters, you need the alignment for focus and clarity, and you need the autonomy in order to be agile and adapt to a fast-changing environment. Cool. So I'm curious about what type of capabilities need to be there in the organization for it to successfully embrace art of action? Okay, well, I'd say there are three preconditions that you have to have. Uh, the first is you have to have people uh, with task competence, good people, well-trained. Secondly, you have to have a clear structure that enables you to identify areas of accountability. And thirdly, you need to have processes that don't constrain you too much. Um, the history of the way the Prussians developed this will give us some clues. Um, they began, actually at the beginning of the 19th century, to transform what was effectively an organization of robots into an organization of thinking individuals by recruiting a different kind of officer and by giving them rigorous training um, in the Berlin War Academy. That ensured that people had sufficient competence in, in the art of war and the art of leadership to be trusted to delegate authority to. Secondly, you've got to have a clear structure. Um, I'm afraid I can think of some organizations whose structures are so complex and convoluted that it's not possible to identify areas of accountability. And if you can't do that, you can't say, well, this is your contribution to the strategy as a whole, and this is yours, and we'll make sure there are no gaps and no overlaps because it's all mired in some end to the power of X matrix. And thirdly, you need processes which do not constrain you unnecessarily. If, if, if managers are all wrapped up having to follow processes that come from goodness knows where um, to do one's not quite sure what, then they become locked in a straitjacket. And no matter how much freedom you say you're giving them, the organization will constrain them through the processes. So those are the three task competence of the people, clear structure, enabling you to identify accountability and processes that don't unnecessarily constrain you. So uh, what type of leadership traits uh, needs to be displayed for art of action to work? It implies a certain style of leadership, um, which, however, also has to be adaptive to the needs of the individuals. So in order to be able to get the clarity of intent that you need, you need somebody who is quite conceptual, but also is able to master the details of a business 
it involves bringing those two aspects together. That's actually quite a rare quality of someone who understands what all the trees in the wood are like, but as we say in English, can still see the wood for the trees. So a change in level from the zooming in on the detail to the zooming out to the conceptual level. It needs to have someone who has a measure of self-confidence, which has the consequence that they're able to accept a certain degree of risk and ambiguity. Um, control freaks are not wanted in all of this, and control freaks usually are actually inside rather scared people who can't tolerate ambiguity, which is why they get out the long screwdrivers. And it needs to have people who are comfortable with a coaching approach to their subordinates, of identifying what they can and cannot do, and of keeping at the edge of their learning zone without pushing them too far into the panic zone, but without leaving them in the comfort zone, which would be the sort of lazy thing to do. So it's being conceptual and being able to deal with ambiguity and master detail as well as the big picture. It's being comfortable with delegation and it's being comfortable with coaching people and developing them. So I'd like to learn a little bit. Uh, there's a trend right now uh, in which companies are generally try to introduce uh, an alignment uh, technique which is called OKRs. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd like to learn your take That's on... That's objectives and key results, isn't it? That, yeah. that is, yes, thank you. That is objectives and key results. Yeah. I'd like to learn a little bit about what are the similarities or potentially differences compared to uh, OKR okay. actions. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I'm only familiar, familiar with OKRs from the literature, and I understand they were invented by Andy Grove and they're used by Google, and are a sort of update, a refresher on the old management by objectives that came from Peter Drucker. So in my understanding, uh, firstly I'd say an objective um, is defined as a, a task, something that has to be done, and a key result is a measure or a milestone. Yeah. Um, I guess in leading through intent, intent is defined as a task plus a purpose, um, and it's the purpose that dominates the task. And so what you're defining are not bits of work to be done, but outcomes that you're seeking to achieve. The second thing that strikes me is that in managing through intent, it's important to understand the overall context in which you're operating. And the briefing method, which is just five questions, the first question is, what's the context? And the second question is, what is the intent of my boss and their boss's boss? So you have to think two levels up. Don't see that in the OKR method. This develops a, an important intellectual discipline of being able to distill the essence of a complex situation and get people to think strategically, people in the middle of the organization to think a couple of levels above them so they can understand the purpose of what they're doing. And that gives them the flexibility to change and become agile. Because we have the purpose as well as the task, you can change your task, you can change what you do if the situation changes as long as you're still trying to fulfill the purpose in a different way. So leading through intent is designed to make agility um, something that happens just like that. You don't, you don't need to go through another review process and have a fast cycle review in order to do that. And then it also involves thinking through what that implies for the next level below you. And these also have to be defined in outcomes that you want your people to achieve. And I can see the potential with OKRs just to generate long lists of stuff that you have to get through without this structuring process. The internet is essentially a structuring process that involves unpacking each level into something more specific. And focusing, importantly, it's focusing. You, you don't have lists, you turn lists into structures so that you know this is the most important thing, this is the leading thought. Or as I put it to people, the answer to the Spice Girls question, which is tell me what you want 
what you really, really want, the one thing that really matters. And I don't see the OKR technique any more than traditional MBOs doing that. So is it fair to say that OKRs um, are an alignment technique? Um, yeah. And you, they um, exercise as like a subset of the art of action approach? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think that the, the questions that OKRs are designed to answer are, are included in any technique that I have deployed to help people to actually embody the art of action. But the art of action is a, an operating model. It's an approach to leadership. It involves a culture and a certain set of values and behaviors. It's holistic. And that technique of objective setting is only part of it. Um, there's a lot of other stuff that has to happen. There's a particular leadership style that has to go along with it as well. So I'd say OKRs is maybe a bit of it. Cool. Thanks. This is Stephen Bungie. Pleasure to have you here. Right. Nice to be here, Matthias.